Good morning, everybody. You know, I usually sanctuaries are full after tragedy. It's awesome to see the sanctuary full after victory. Congratulations to the Astros this week. Well, we are two weeks in this week to a worship series called God's Story, Our Story, where we're talking about how when we worship, we enter into God's story, and that story becomes the story of our lives as well as the people of God. And I am I'm so excited today because I'm not preaching. So that's, that's going to be an awesome thing. You don't all have to applaud at once, all right? I understand. Uh, Melissa Pagan, who you know is Ariel's wife. Really, Ariel's her husband, if I were to say that properly. Yes, yes. God has given her a call. And I've seen it since I've known her. And she's known about it for a long time. And I just knew one day she was going to approach me and say, I feel called to preach. Well, it just so happened that this coincided with the series and something that, yeah. that Melissa's passionate about and that she knows a lot about as well because she's been trained in it. And she said, do you think I could deliver a word? I said, yeah, this is kind of your thing, right? It's your call. It's your thing. You're ready for this. God has given her this word and these gifts. And I'm so excited uh, about what she's uh, prepared, what God's placed on her heart to share with all of us today. So let's give God praise for Melissa bringing the word. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to pray, uh, pray us in. Yes. Let us pray. Lord, I am so grateful today uh, for a break from preaching so that my soul can be filled. I thank you for your servant, Melissa, and the word that you've given her, Lord, and for her faithfulness to bring it. I pray that you would fill her up to overflowing, that you would allow your word to come into all of our lives and to begin to do its work in us and change us, God. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. Uh, remove any nerves that Melissa has. Help your word to shine clearly through her today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Lance. I'm going to sit because uh, I don't normally wear heels. But uh, I figured to be the opposite of Lance, you have to wear heels, right? All right, well, the title of the message is A Sacrifice of Praise. And um, something that I love about the watershed is that it's a meeting ground of many different churches in, into one. Even though we are housed under the Methodist label, I know there are a lot of people from different backgrounds because I am one. I actually came from a Lutheran church in this area. Um, I was raised, baptized, confirmed in the Lutheran tradition. So um, this is quite different from me. Women do not preach in the Lutheran church. Um, you know, while we did the traditional services, sit, stand, kneel, the church actually broke some ground in creating a contemporary service. And this was back in the days of Twyla Paris and Wayne Watson and Sandy Patty. I don't know if any of y'all old timers remember them. Yeah. Uh, so this was like, this was new. Um, and while it, while it was new, my dad was involved in the evolution. He brought an acoustic guitar into a traditional or liturgical where, you know, more high church sermon series kind of setting. And, uh, he got some hate mail for that by people who didn't like the change. But anyway, when they did bring in the contemporary service, drums, guitar, all that, um, the most you would ever see happening was like an ever so slightly raised hand or some corporate clapping for a few measures. Um, that was about as out of control as it would get for this, you know, Lutheran church um, and the waspish or white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nature of the, com of the congregation. And actually, as time went on, my parents um, became displeased with the, the direction of contemporary Christian music and contemporary worship and reverted back to attending the uh, now electronic pipe organ and robes version of church services. Um, but I was a teenager, so in the nature of all teens, I rebelled. <laughs> Surprise. And I went to the youth service, which was a little bit more rockin', you know, and uh, met my husband, who was a, you know, the worship leader here, and he was playing guitar. Uh, that was still pretty moderate, uh, all things considered, you know, other than a few obscene guitar solos by the aforementioned worship leader. <laughs> he, uh, he doesn't do those as often anymore. He's, he's, tam he's tamed the beast. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, in our adult lives, we've been to several churches in this area, and I say, when I say several, I mean several. Um, and corporate worship is all pretty much the same. People will stand, they'll sing the songs, you might see some clapping, but faces, posture, don't necessarily reflect the words that are being sung. And 
when I was the same. So what changed? Um, I had a moment of extreme discomfort for me where we were attending a local church and I saw things that were completely foreign in terms of worship. And my initial response, because of my personality type, was to be judgmental and confused and uncomfortable. And God spoke to me in that judgment, and he said, you're Cain. You think that your reserved, reverent worship is somehow more acceptable to me than what these people are bringing. I was like, huh, I don't like that. <laughs> um, so I decided to learn beyond what I had been taught worship was and to see what the Bible says about worship uh, is. So it transformed me drastically. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with kind of a history lesson because, you know, after a rough day, I'll always say, oh, I wish I could change places with you. And Ariel's a history teacher. And so, you know, he's like, do it. You've got three kids. I've got 135. Okay, well, so now I think, you know, we've got probably, probably more than you have in an average classroom in here. So I'll take the opportunity to switch roles with you, and you can be mom when you go home. <laughs> All right, so the first lesson that we see is that culture and not scripture has been the greatest influencer on worship. We start with temple worship. Okay, so back in the times of David, 12 orchestra members and 12 singers. A lot more than we had today. Um, it's been described as celebrating, loud-sounding, and exuberant. Synagogue worship after the destruction of the temple became restrained. Historians have pointed to a couple reasons, including exposure to different cultures, changing their worship style, um, slavery of the Jews, re sorry, restricting their freedom of practices, um, the laws of the Sabbath work and instruments caused a concern for more uh, conservative rabbis that preparing your instrument for a Sunday morning was work. Well, sorry, not Sunday, a Sabbath, but so they said no more instruments. Um, and then they were saying that joyous worship in light of Jewish suffering was inappropriate. Um, and then finally, one of the more interesting things for me, given my current circumstances, is that Puritanical Jews viewed the voices of women in combination with the voices of men as something that could lead to impurity. And so they banned women from singing. And so if you go to a synagogue today, you will um, generally not hear music in Jewish services. They don't do it anymore. So this all kind of stopped music in Jewish services. And early Christians originally reflected the Jewish traditions in their worship because they were Jews. Um, it limited singing. We start to see reintroduction of music and chorals in an attempt to minister to and evangelize to the outsiders, the Gentiles. Um, Ephesians 5.19 talks about it when it says, minister to each other with spiritual songs and hymns. And so Gentile Christians who didn't feel the same obligation as Jews to hold to Jewish traditions wanted the music. So Jews had to change their practices. And I think it's really cool because when you look at the watershed, it's kind of a reflection of that. We break out of the Methodist tradition of you know, hymns out of the hymnal, and we are doing something in an effort to reach a group of people beyond the traditional Methodist church. I think it's working pretty well. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch it grow. Um, at any rate, second century Christians began singing antiphonally, which means taking turns singing, still without instruments. And this was not because of scripture, but because of Ignatius of Antioch. Dude had a vision, and so things changed. Gregorian chant is the next shift with the establishment of the mass being done only by monks. And that went from the 11th century on um, and was done into the Renaissance. So Reformation caused a split with Zwinglians and Calvinists and other radical reformers going one dire direction as far away from the Catholic Church as they could get, even including removing the main traditional instrument, the pipe organ, out of churches. Um, so that's why Calvinists don't sing music or have instruments. And now you've got uh, the other side of that coin was Lutherans and Wesleyans who actually went the opposite direction and started writing new songs. You know, we know that Luther wrote some songs and uh, Wesley wrote some songs, obviously. Um, and those actually, Wesley was different in that he said, I'm going to write about how my relationship with God makes me feel. Ooh, like straight not out of scripture, right? <laughs> so um, then we go into 
early American colonists who stuck with singing metered psalms, not because of theology necessarily, but because they didn't have printed hymnals. So when those are, re- those are introduced in the mid-18th century, that changes things. You see the Great Awakenings focused on individual relationships, increased singing. Um, 1801 is when the first African-American hymnal is published, which starts influencing the American style of hymnody. Then you see um, hymn singing actually approved by the first church, the uh, Anglican Church, in 1820. So they were still doing the mass up until 1820 in the Anglican Church. In America, though, gospel music was coined as a term in 1874, and so that further diversifies church music. 1950s, the southern gospel music hits the scene. Jesus music of the 60s is popularized in the 70s. And then contemporary Christian music is mainstreamed in the 80s and beyond. And that's what history says worship has been in the church. And I hinted at something earlier uh, about my dad getting hate mail. Um, It's true. It's not, it's kind of a sad story, but it's true. Um, That's what worship leaders call the worship wars. Sounds ominous, and it is, actually, if you think about it in terms of what it is. It's a spiritual battle. But really what it is is it's people being upset about a worship style not being their worship style. Um, So I'm in a Facebook group. Who isn't? But I'm in a Facebook group that's a bunch of worship leaders and I posed the question, what are some of the reasons you've heard of people protesting against demonstrable, which means, you know, able to be demonstrated physically, or um, contemporary Christian music? And I got some responses back that I've heard most of them before, but some of them were, like, out there. Um, one that I heard was, uh, it's out of place in a worship service to be demonstrable, or it doesn't take all that in church. Um, it's irreverent, you know, I've heard that many, many times, sometimes at my, at my parents' house. Uh, we don't talk about worship anymore at my parents' house. <laughs> we don't talk about a lot of things anymore at my parents' house. Um, anyway, some of the other things were that I've heard that are more understandable is it's a performance or it's fake. All right, okay. Um, it's not my personality. I get that. Or it's not a part of my tradition. I'm living evidence of that. Um, or I'll pretend to be holy and I'm not, which is interesting. Um, and then people will look at me and think I'm weird. Well, I've never cared about that, but, you know. Then you get the more wild ones, like it's emotion manufacturing. Um, you clap too loud and you're distracting me. Um, yeah. And then the most bizarre ones, <laughs> the word demon is indemonstrable. Okay, and uh, someone will see me and hold me to a higher standard of Christian living. Ooh. All right, well, so that's what people have said about why they don't engage in demonstrable worship. But what does Scripture say about it? Because that's the most important thing. All right, that leads us to the biblical words of worship, and there are seven Hebrew words of praise or thanksgiving. They have practical applications that are often ignored or demeaned as charismatic. Because we like charisma in our politicians or in, you know, our sports teams, but we don't like it in church for some reason, right? All right, so the first word is yada. It means extending hands in longing and childlike desire and is mentioned 53 times in praise, 32 times as thanksgiving in the scriptures. So Isaiah 38, 19 says, The living, they praise you. That's yada. As I am doing today, parents tell their children about your faithfulness. Well, that's great. We're doing all of this, right? Like we send our kids to the kids' church, and we, pr- we sing our praise songs, right? Mm, well, okay, hold up. We're reading this in the English translation, right? And there are different English translations, but they all say the word praise. But what they don't tell you is that the word that is in that scripture is yada. And yada means extending hands. So it's not just singing the song. It's more. See, this is the thing. Like, when my kids walk up to me, and I have three, all under the age of five because I'm insane. Um, when they walk up to me and they want to be comforted, I've taught them to do something. Or maybe I didn't even teach it to them. Maybe it was inherent. What, what do your kids do when they walk up to you and want to be picked up? Some of y'all are parents. All right, so when we're up here, we're walking up to our Father God. We come into his presence. We walk up to him, and we're saying, God, 
my life sucks right now. My bank notes do like <laughs> I can't go and buy my new like clothes that I want and my kids are brats. Pick me up, make me feel better. You think he's going to pay attention to that? Like really, like if my kids walk up to me and say, "Mommy, pick me up." And they don't raise their hands, even my 1-year-old, y'all, he knows. He comes to me hands raised. Yada, a child longing for its parent. All right, the next word is tauda. And it's similar. It means to extend hands in a confession of praise. And this one we see in Psalms 50, 14, sacrifice thank offerings, tauda, to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. Psalms 42, 4, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Jeremiah 30, 19, there will be joy and songs of thanksgiving. That's all Tauda. I will multiply my people, not diminish them. I will honor them, not despise them. So those last verses, they sound kind of exciting. I mean, you've got, you know, festive throng, shouts of joy and praise, joy and songs of thanksgiving. It sounds like a party. Like, that's what our church should be. We should be so excited about what we are singing about that others want to know why we have that excitement, right? So this is the thing. God says that he will bless people who are a part of that. If we want the blessings of God, we have to do the things that God says will bring us those blessings. It's that simple. My favorite one is Hallel, which means to make a show to be outrageously and completely foolish in expression. I like being foolish. Celebrate and spin around with violent emotion. Can't do that anymore. I get motion sick. Or to shine. 99. 99 times this is mentioned in the Old Testament. And I do it like, you know, maybe like once every month, right? First Chronicles 16.10. Find joy exalt, glory, boast, all hallel in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who keep on seeking the Lord rejoice. This is one of my favorite scriptures coming up right here. It was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison, in praise. Make themselves heard. You can't sing quiet. And thanksgiving to the Lord as they praise the Lord singing. Praise the Lord because he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Then, this is the best part, the house of the Lord was suddenly filled with a cloud shining with the light of the Lord's presence, and they could not continue the service of worship. Dude, like, I get chills when I think about that, because it, okay, we trust the scripture to be right and true. So we trust the scripture when it says that they had to stop the service because they ushered the presence of the Lord in with such intensity that they could not physically continue to worship. Now, something that I believe is that this can be done today, right? I mean, I don't think that God is limited to only act in the Old Testament. I believe that if we do what he says brings about his blessings, he will be present with us, and he will give us those blessings back. So something that I mentioned earlier was uh, not reflecting the lyrics that we sing, and a privilege and a curse of being trained in worship leading is that you get force-fed videos of yourself doing it. <laughs> it's not pretty. <laughs> um, you learn that you make all kinds of weird faces and that you stand in a really weird manner. It's just not pretty. Nobody likes the way their voice sounds, right? Like, okay, so the thing is, though, that anybody that's up on this platform, their vision is this. It's your face. It's your posture. So uh, if we're singing, nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns on. What are you doing after the service? We'll shout your praise for Jesus. Our I'm going to go get a donut. You want a donut? Does it sound like you believe the words? Like, really? I mean, let's stop and think about it. Does it sound like you believe the words? If you look bored, does it sound like, does it look like you believe nothing shall be impossible? I mean, like, seriously, if nothing was impossible and our house note was paid off, I'd be like, woo! Nothing was impossible. My kids didn't destroy everything in their room. Seriously. 
Like, let, okay, let's look at this from a different perspective, though, right? We just had a major victory in the World Series. Am I right? Woo! Oh, y'all do know how to do it. Uh-huh. Now, let's see. Um, what about that congregation? I'm sorry, crowd in those Astro games. Even the ones where they weren't playing, Minute Maid was packed to the gills. And everybody, all the commentators, Joe Buck and his annoying freaking self couldn't stop saying how loud those freaking Astros, you know, teams and their fans were, right? I've never heard a stadium so loud. I've, I mean, just even with the roof closed, this is a seriously loud stadium. Yeah, we get you, Joe. Anyway, they were excited, right? But let's look at this. Like, we're going to these games. We have no problem doing the wave. Oh, what, what word of worship do you think that one is? Tauda, uh-huh. We have no problem with twirling rally towels. Hello. Yeah, we don't do banner waving here, but I've seen it happen, and it's, it's weird. Um, <laughs> they have no problem with the... Un- da 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 Ah, uh-huh. Baseball fans. That's another word that's coming up. But those Astros, let me tell you, man, I don't know, I still got stuck in my craw. They failed us in 2005. Who remembers that? Mm-hmm. Four games of the World Series, no runs. We, I mean, they ended the World Series early because they sucked that bad. 2006, I was in Cardinals territory by myself for a month with my Cardinals fan cousins. And what happened? Lost a pennant, right? And yet, they still, like, like had fans, right? They generally sucked. From that time on until 2015. Who remembers the last rose? The disaster rose? Yeah? Yeah? Hey, man, I'm a fan too, but you try being stuck in Cardinal territory with, you know, a bunch of Cardinals fans and you're wearing your Astros gear and you're watching them get their, their hineys kicked. It hurts. And yet here we are, World Series, and people are lining up for hours to buy gear, to buy tickets, paying, I'm sorry, how much were those standing room only tickets? Like what, 800 bucks? Standing room only. And uh, God's like, hey, I've never failed you. I've never let you down. I give you life. I give you sustenance. I give you salvation. But you're uncomfortable about raising your hands in worship? You're uncomfortable about shouting an amen when Pastor Lance makes a good point, right? Y'all, this is the God of the universe. We can do better for him. Amen? Thank you. All right, the next one we have is Tehillah. It means hymns of praise, God enthroned, spirit praise. It's a little bit more deep than it seems, y'all. Deuteronomy 10.21, he is the one you praise, Tehillah. He is your God who performed for you these great and awesome works that I have been telling you about. Psalms 22.5, to you they cried out and were saved. That is Tehillah that cried out. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. Habakkuk 3.3, 3, God is coming from Edom. The holy God is coming from the hills of Paran. His splendor covers the heaven, and the earth is full of his praise. Tehillah. We ought to be singing songs of praise that enthrone God and connect on a spiritual level. Fifty times in the Old Testament this one is mentioned. And then it's, we see it in Second Chronicles 20.22, 20, the praises of the army of Judah brought them literal, physical victory in battle. It wasn't their might. It wasn't their weapons. It was their praise. We aren't just singing a song. It's not like singing happy birthday at a birthday party. We are crying out to the God of the universe, and we are putting our trust in him. This is what we're doing in worship. Something of a spiritual connection that is happening, that is us reflecting what God has done for us. We aren't accessing the power of this when we just stand and sing out of obligation. We have to lose ourselves to allow God to move through our worship. Some say Tehillah is different from the next word and that it requires spontaneity. Sing to the Lord a new song taken literally. If we listen to Hillsong albums or, you know, whoever your CCM band of choice is, you know, sometimes you notice that there's a break in between the singing where you can hear people pouring out and shouting out and saying things. That would be Tehillah. 
If you've ever wondered why earlier we, we had that break in the music where there's like that instrumental part, that is a space quite intentionally left for you to add your praise. We don't do it, so you can wonder what's holding up Ariel's hair. <laughs> it's witchcraft, by the way. So that's Tahilla. Tahilla is spontaneous or spirit-filled praise. The next one is Zamar, and it means to play an instrument, sing with music, celebrate musically. Obviously, we do this every week at the watershed, but it's important to note that the music part of this service is just as important. And I'm not saying this because he's an employee. It is just as important as the rest of it. After all, this particular version of praise is mentioned 40 times in the Psalms. Psalms 27, 6 says, At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Zamar. All right. The next word is Shabbat, which means to shout in a loud tone. I hear a fan of this one. Commanding and triumphant, and some include clapping in this one. We ought to be shouting praises and triumphs and clapping our hands. Psalms 47.1 says, Oh, clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. It shows up again in Psalms 145.4. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall shabak. Shout in a loud tone, proclaim your good works. Isaiah 12.6, shout aloud and sing for joy is all shabak. It's a little more than singing along, though. I mean, it can be awkward if you've been clapping and the person next to you stops clapping, right? And then suddenly you stop clapping, and then suddenly nobody's clapping. Yeah. Um, but if you feel the urge to clap, then that's something you need to do. Similarly, if Pastor Lance makes a point and you really agree with it, you know, it really resonates with you, don't hold back that amen. There can be no more appropriate response than to proclaim your agreement with what he has said. So what this isn't saying is that we just make it through a Sunday. I've been at churches where that's the goal, and it's dead. You don't want to do that. We want to change ourselves so that we can change a generation to, for the sake of those that follow, which a lot of them happen to be our children, right? Right? And uh, in that, that only comes in, in committing ourselves to worship 100%. Thank you. All right, the last word is Barack, and this is not the president. So, you can, uh, it's okay. You can participate in this one, all you Republicans out there. This one means kneel down, bless God as an act of adoration. All right, this is the most uncomfortable, and I will 100% be real with y'all. I have not done it. Psalms 95.6 says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel. Psalms 34.1, I will extol Barak, the Lord, at all times. His praise, Tehillah, will ever be on my lips. Y'all remember Tehillah? A confession of praise. Here's the thing about those acts. Tehillah is God, I'm sorry, Tehillah is God enthroned spirit praise. And we can't enthrone something without proclaiming ourselves as lesser. When we look at that, like, and what actually is involved in kneeling or bowing down, it's, it's removing ourselves from the equation. Because kneeling is not comfortable. I'm only 30 and it hurts. Like, my calves go dead. I don't know what the deal is, like, if my pants are too tight or if I need to, like, start running. But my calves literally go to sleep if I'm kneeling on the floor too long to tie my kids' shoes. Ground is dirty. It's cold. It means that I'm lowering myself. If somebody wanted to come over and slap me upside the head, they'd have an easier target. And uh, basically, the thing is that when we do this, it's a sacrifice of pride and comfort. That leads me to my third point. Sac worship is a sacrifice. And it's a sacrifice that's not a simple one-liner. Lance was talking about this last week. Sacrifice and time gathering with the church body, like it's mentioned in Hebrews 10.25. Do not neglect the gathering of the body. I'm so glad to see all of y'all here because this is a very good thing that we're doing. We sacrifice our time and, and we sacrifice our money in tithes and offering, like Lance has been talking about, 
Ariel and I have been tithing forever, and I can tell you that it has literally changed every aspect of our life. And then most importantly, we sacrifice in self, singing and praising beyond our comfort. I'll say it again, beyond our comfort. Because if we are comfortable, it means that we are focusing on ourselves, the opposite of the point of worship. Let's go back to the post-temple Jewish traditions. So they cut down on worship because of slavery. But we're free in Christ. That's right. They cut down on worship because of slavery. We are free in Christ. They hyperfixated on the laws of Sabbath work, but we are living under a new covenant. They muted their worship because of suffering. But we know that in this world, you will have troubles, and sometimes their name will be Harvey, and we're going to praise in that storm regardless. We are not called to be slaves to our culture or customs. Cultures shift. Just look at the Jews. They went from vibrant worship to no singing. We are not called to be slaves to those customs. No, my parents now go to an even more traditional church. But I'm not called to honor that tradition. I'm called to honor God. I, we cannot hide behind that this is how I was raised in my granny's church. God love your granny, but that's not the point. We must be constantly seeking the word of God challenging ourselves to be new creations. We need to step outside of ourselves, out of our comfort levels, just as God stepped outside of his comfortable, perfect heaven, came to a very uncomfortable and messy earth, lived the uncomfortable life of a man, and died the extremely uncomfortable death on a cross. He came into this broken world seeking us. He wants us. Our messy quirky, expressive selves, and he wants it in our worship. There was never a promise for comfort in the call to follow Christ. But it is in the discomfort, in serving others, giving our tithe, and expressive and biblical worship where we are blessed the most. So here's a challenge. Evaluate where you are in terms of the biblical words of worship. I challenge you to take your worship a step further. If you don't sing, sing. I'm not the greatest, and he lets me put a microphone up to my face and sing every, every now and then. <laughs> Your praise is a sweet sound in the ear of the Savior who created you specifically to worship him, whether your ear thinks it sounds sweet or not. And who cares what the person next to you thinks? They probably don't sound all that great either. If you sing, shout. If you clap, extend your hands in longing or in a confession of praise. If you lift your hands, kneel if you feel compelled. We bow down and worship you now. I've never done that, y'all, but we sing it. In 2 Samuel, we read David danced nearly naked. This was, this was intense for several reasons, right? They don't go out naked as Jews. They don't dance na nearly naked in front of women, and it says that he was surrounded by slave girls. And... Uh, Thirdly, he was a king, and he had removed his robe of kingship, the symbol of his most important earthly identity, casting it off and humbling himself before the creator in his created form to worship him. I want you all to read 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 23, and reflect on the responses of the daughter of Saul, Michal, to David's dancing and David's reaction to her anger at his worship. Are we worried about what others think of our worship more than we are about what God tells us it should be? I sure hope not because, again, the blessings of God only come from doing the things he tells us bring his blessings. That's all I got for y'all. Let's pray. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go ahead and pray, y'all. God, we thank you. We thank you for giving us insight into your word. We thank you for telling us, even when it seems simple, how to go about praising you. 
We thank you that you created a language that has so many different nuances to it that we can have a clear-cut vision of what worship should look like. And we thank you for providing us with an opportunity to mimic what heaven will be here in our earthly worship. Please help us to go about our day in safety and to reflect on these words, put them into our heart, and to exemplify them so that we change a generation so the generations that follow will talk about what we have done here today. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.